So the way we're going to run this is I've got a couple of slides just to set the scene, what's, what's going on, sort of building on what Janet said at, at the plenary yesterday. Um, and then I think we've got Thomas, Amy, and no, Sven, Thomas, Amy coming up in that order to just give their views um, from their experience. But this all relies on, on your questions. So basically, you've got about 20 minutes to get all of the caffeine in you that you need. Think of some great questions. Otherwise, it's going to be a very painful hour. Um, so if we just start to look at, at the industry. Um, so we, we had Janet yesterday morning talking about the growth in terms of company numbers and income and, and therapies hitting the market. And that's sort of reflected um, on the far right-hand slide there. But obviously, that's driving more and more shipments. So that graph is, is data from World Courier, and we're, we're seeing the steady increase. Uh, the dips are only around Christmas, so we don't seem to treat anybody in, in January. But as we're moving up, then more and more shipments means things are getting more and more complex. At the moment, supply chains are managed manually, paper-driven systems, relationship-driven. You know, the driver knows, knows the nurse, the nurse knows the pharmacist kind of thing. So what happens when somebody goes on holiday? So as we scale up and you start putting zeros on the number of patients you treat, how do we standardize and operationalize and, and sort of almost automate those processes? If we look at, at challenge two, it, it's really globalizing. So again, this, this is our data. Um, over the last 12 months, we've delivered into over 50 countries. Now, interestingly, that's a heat map where green is the hottest area, but red just didn't show up so well on the graph. So you've got North America. Obviously, there's a lot going on there, a lot going on in Western Europe. Um, and it's really nice to see as a Brit that the UK is really punching above its weight. But then some interesting things going on. It's got quite a lot happening in Latin America uh, in terms of imports and exports of cell and gene. Quite a lot happening in Australia. Uh, Japan is, is up there, it's unfortunate, it's very small to see. And then China, suddenly there's a lot of interest in China and some massive challenges moving live cells in and out um, of China, especially if you've got a 24-hour shelf life. And then if you look at the clinical sites, so we've delivered to over 2,000 clinical sites in the last 12 months, which I think if you went back five or 10 years, there was probably just UPenn on its own. Um, and we're now distributing globally. and Interestingly, people are coming more and more into the US, into the centralized US, and not just the coasts any longer. And that presents its own challenges. So we, we need to think about our global distribution as well. And the destinations are changing. So if we start on, on the bottom graph, this was data that was generated uh, at the Facilitate Europe Leaders Conference a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so Western Europe, North America, that's where most people are exporting from. That's where most people are manufacturing. And that makes sense. But if you look at the change, what's anticipated to happen in five years' time, that green bar, Eastern Europe, you know, manufacturing is going to drop away. But Middle East, APAC, Latin America, there's an indication there that people are going to put manufacturing sites into those locations. Now, whether that's driven by some kind of distributed strategy because they've only got a 24-hour shelf life so they have to put local manufacturing in or whether that's driven by economics because it's cheaper there I, I, I don't know yet but then if you look at the import Western Europe US broadly staying the same but massive changes in Eastern Europe Middle East APAC and Latin America which is most scary when you overlap that with where people's perceived most difficult logistics challenges so what people are trying to do is grow into areas that it's the most difficult to ship these products into. So how are we going to address that? How are we going to think in advance? And then finally, the, the temperatures that people are shipping at at the moment. Really, everybody's saying cryo or refrigerated, and I think you could probably equate that to cryo being the therapy going out and refrigerated being the, the donation coming in. But then that's going to change as well. So people are seeing a lot of growth or they're expanding into the colder temperatures. I think that's really driven by the need for a longer shelf life. You know, you can't ship from Central Europe to the west coast of the US in under 24 hours consistently enough to be able to commercialize a product. So you have to commercialize. And if you can't, then that impacts on your manufacturing strategy. So from a logistics point of view, the world is changing. We're moving forwards. 
and we need to think about how that happens. So really, at the end of my setup really is we've got growing volumes, we've got growing geographic distribution, evolving destinations and evolving temperatures. And if you look back as a pure supply chain, that quote from McKinsey basically says the supply chain is driving your competitiveness. Because your process development, you do it and it's basically fixed for the lifetime of that product. The supply chain is evolving and growing all the way through. So what are we going to do to set that up for success? So with that, I'll hand over to, sorry, who was next? Was it Sven first? Brilliant. Thank you, Simon. Good morning, everybody. I hope uh, everybody who's here, uh, you guys are absolutely the dedicated few that have decided to join us, and hopefully we won't let you down. <clears throat> so Simon's asked me to talk about some of the lessons learned with autologous supply chain, and so my history uh, is that I'm ex-Genzyme, I led all the medical activities for Epicel, Carticel, Macy, and then also most recently led um, the cell and gene therapy development group within rare diseases for GSK, and so led the commercialization, well, approval and commercialization of Stromvelis, and also a number of other programs. So I have a little bit of experience with um, this type of area, and we dealt with everything from shelf life of six short hours to 24 hours to three days to six days. So you can imagine some of the discussions with something with six hours versus, versus six days. So uh, these are my disclosures. I have no conflicts of interest uh, for today. So um, what I've tried to do is just kind of lay out very simply um, what the, the autologous logistics chain looks like. <clears throat> and you can see, uh, first and foremost, the patient is really at the center of that first circle. And that's, you know, that's critical. This is why we're here. This is why we're spending three days at this beautiful beachside resort learning about all of the cool new technology. So it's all about the patient. Um, and then you can see we take the cells, um, and we've got a number of different activities that go on around that mechanism over there. And apologies for some of the... Um, the transport there, the truck looks like it's driving over the words. Um, but that just gives you a little bit of a flavor for, for what this autologous mechanism looks like. Um, and instead of regaling you with stories of horror and some of the cool things that I've managed to see over the last few years, I'm going to just talk about some of the, the really critical pain points that is really worth thinking about if you're developing um, this type of therapy. So the first thing is the patient and the patient screening. Um, and this is, this is critically important. We often forget about this because we're thinking about the technology. But we need to make sure the patient is right, the patient is ready, particularly autologous. You know, if you're taking cells that might be sensitive to the patient getting a cold, or if it's a man, man flu, or anything like that, these can affect your starting materials, and you need to consider that very carefully. Um, think about in Europe, there are very strict consenting requirements, not only for the procedure, but also for the harvesting of cells and tissues. And so, you, you know, these patients are often signing a, a large number of consent forms. So preparing that patient is absolutely important. So then the next thing we get on to is going to collect the cells. Um, and, you know, this is really easy. The patient comes into whatever facility and, you know, you, you harvest the cells from them in an OR, uh, in an apheresis unit, in an AN, other cardiac unit, wherever that may be. But you can see that little thing on the side there, the preconditioning of the transport box. Um, and invariably, you know, uh, Simon hinted to this earlier, you've very often got one person or two people that have actually learned how to condition that transport box. Uh, and invariably, the day your procedure happens, one is on holiday and the other one's rotated to another unit. And all of the lovely words and the instructions that you've written that are included with the box have mysteriously disappeared or that person can't read that day. And so all of a sudden you end up the courier arriving and the box hasn't been preconditioned and all of a sudden it's panic station. So it's really important to ensure that you've got the appropriate training in place so that that type of activity doesn't happen and you don't get uh, caught out by that. Uh, the packaging and the QC within the hospital is critically important, and that will come down to your specific training, and you can imagine all the things that may go wrong there. Um, 
Transport is really, really important. Uh, we just take transport for granted because most of us buy stuff from Amazon, you know, and you press one click and then magically next day the drone drops it off at your house and ba boom, that's it. Uh, but unfortunately here we're transporting across borders and invariably you've got humans involved and humans always let the side down. Uh, and then throw into that uh, weather conditions. Uh, very often if you're transporting on an aeroplane, on a ferry, things like that, those things get disrupted. And so you need to build all of these challenge into, uh, into your process and into your design. Um, we then move into the, the product manufacture, and this is the area you've spent all of your time and your effort uh, really optimizing. But the thing to always remember is in an autologous product, the patient is the starting material, and the patient very often hasn't read the manual. And so their cells may not be to the level and to the entry requirements that you need them to be. The, the concentration may be too low, the number may be too low, um, the, the tissue sample that was taken may be too small, it may contain the wrong types of cells. And this ends up being quite a problem, especially when you know at 6 o'clock in the evening you have to phone the hospital and say, oh, sorry, guess what, we need another biopsy. Or uh, they may be kept in quarantine and what is your quarantine situation? Think about um, also in, in the EU, Human Tissue Directive requires uh, a number of testing, five different infectivity tests. Uh, where are you going to have those done? Are you going to do them in-house or are you going to have uh, the, the hospital do them? If you have the hospital do them and you've got 10, 15 different hospitals, do you know that they're all standardized in the way they test? So it's important to think about how you're going to manage these issues and then if you have a positive test, what does that mean? Um, so if you have a positive HIV, the regulators aren't going to allow you to process those cells in the same facility with the same air handling capacity as normal uninfected patients. And then the challenge becomes that that HIV positive test may actually be a false positive. The patient may be completely uninfected, may be non-infective at, at any stage. Hepatitis B is the same thing. Um, so it's really important to understand the meaning of those tests. Uh, then we move on to cryo and the final QC testing before you get into release. <clears throat> and this obviously becomes really important because now, particularly if you have a fresh product or a very short shelf life, this is when the clock really starts ticking. So you need to think about your QC and your final release testing. How many of you do sterility tests that take you know, or maybe um, back T alert, 72 hours maybe. By that time, you know, the product's in the patient already. And so when your positive comes back, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to call them up and say, yeah, I think we need our cells back because they might be infected? So you need to be thinking about what are you going to do in the case of something going wrong, some kind of a positive. And nine times out of ten, to be fair, it's a false positive but you need to have thought through these kind of scenarios before it goes, because once it's in the patient, you can wave goodbye to it. Um, we get back to transporting back to the hospital. Once again, <coughs> snowstorms, uh, there are Icelandic volcanoes that spew ash into the, into the atmosphere that uh, all of a sudden airplanes can't fly through, and you, know, you wouldn't believe the kind of problems those have, um, particularly in many European countries. Um, their air traffic controllers go on strike for no obvious reason. Um, sometimes they block off motorways. And if you're reliant on these mechanisms of transport, you can lose and you can literally see your shelf life ticking away uh, while your product is sitting, uh, waiting in the hold of an airplane, waiting to take off. So it's really important to think about what are you going to be your alternatives? How are you tracking these things so that if this happens, you have some alternatives on hand and you've already thought about it and planned for it. Um, then one of my favorite areas, delivery to the hospital site. Um, and, and this is really, you know, this is something that should be normal. The courier arrives and they go to the treatment center, be it the OR, be it, um, you know, the, the bone marrow transplant unit, whatever unit that is. And that, that's great. For, for most of the couriers, that's absolutely fine. But what happens if you, you've got a replacement guy on, where do most couriers go to hospitals? They go round the back to the post room, and they've got this box. And so the guys in the post room say, no, you don't, need to, you don't deliver it to the ward or to the OR, you leave it with us. And then they try and phone the nurse or the doctor, and the doctor's scrubbed up in theater, and the nurse is busy on rounds and has got their phone switched off. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, 12 hours later, the clinician's phoning you and saying, where the hell are my patient's cells? 
and these cells are sitting busy expiring in the post room. So it's so critically important that that last part of that logistics chain, and the one that very often the logistics company isn't responsible for, that you absolutely sorted for this. And very often it's worthwhile putting someone in place in that hospital, taking the courier by hand and walking them through. And then preparing the product. <clears throat> um, many of us you know, are shipping, and Simon's talked about the, the various mechanisms of keeping these products cool. And if you're cryopreserved or, you, uh, or you're chilled or you're frozen, there is a degree of preparation that's required. And there is teaching that's required around that as to how to prepare these products. Um, and so that education that you provide to the hospital is critically important because invariably the people that have learned it are off on holiday as they were for the, for the biopsy. Um, and you know you get to the point where the clinician wants to inject the cells or implant the cells and they turn around and say, could I have the cells? And then everyone's looking around for them and someone's like, oh yes, they're in the freezer. Um, and so these kind of things are critically important. At the moment, the types of technologies and the types of indications we're addressing aren't in the millions. And so you know, hospitals are only often doing 20, 30, 50, 60 of these a year. And that's just often not enough of a volume to get the staff absolutely used to them. So hopefully that's given you a bit of an idea of what should be a very simple and, 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 and an uncomplex mechanism that can actually go wrong. So it's really important that you plan for these things and you sit down and you think about them. So just some of the areas that I would really encourage you to think about. Um, they are quite complex and you do require a lot of coordination. Think about from the company, the salespeople, medical, commercial, ordering and invoicing. If you're a small company, maybe two people do all of that. But if you're a large company, GSK or an other, these are different departments who've never even met each other or spoken to each other. And if they don't speak to each other and coordinate, things go wrong. In the hospital, doctors, nurses, admin, scheduling office very often don't speak adequately to each other to the level that they need to. You often need to make those connections. Manufacturing, the planning, the QP release. Make sure you have your QP for product release available because when the clock has started ticking on your six-hour shelf life, if that person's off having lunch and they're in a country where they insist on an hour, hour and a half lunch, you've lost an hour of your shelf life already before they even come in to do your release. So it's, it's about planning these things ahead of time. Your courier, your ability to track, uh, critically important to track that courier because so often you have the clinician ready. Maybe they were going to implant those cells at 11 a.m. and at 9 a.m. there was a break in whatever they do and they say, oh, I'll go and do those cells quickly and then all of a sudden the cells aren't there and they call you up, where is the courier? Knowing where that courier is, hopefully he's in the coffee shop downstairs, but he may be stuck on the motorway. So it's really important to be able to track and know where that person is. Um, I would really suggest uh, having someone act as a control center. Now, this doesn't have to be a big flashing lights, television screens everywhere control center. It could be a person with a telephone, uh, but that has just is following this whole process all the way along and knows what's going on. And so you have one person that when when the wheels fall off, you've got one person to phone and that person knows what's happening and they can try and sort the problems out. Um, agreements. Agreements are critically important. And, ha you know, we all have normal supplier agreements and payer agreements and things like that. Make sure your agreements cover when things go wrong uh, because that's always where the arguments start and the blame starts, starts coming out. So make sure that you cover that very well. Review your process regularly and don't forget about the patient because the patient is at the center of everything we do and we're doing this all here for the patient. And then everyone talks about controlling costs and I'm sure Simon has had many people complaining to him about the cost of these logistics. The, the one thing I would say is, you know, don't skimp on quality. Uh, it's because you don't pay a good company that things very often go wrong. That's not to say things don't happen with a, with a good company, but really don't skimp on the quality. Uh, consider the time sensitivity of your transport. Where are you going to and going from? Um, think about, do you need a, a global supplier or do you need a number of regional suppliers? What does your manufacturing and your supply chain look like? How many manufacturing facilities do you have? Where are your centers that you're going to be administering? And where are the strengths of the different companies? Don't forget the training, 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 training. Train everyone from the admins to the nurses to the clinicians to the transport people. Everyone you can think of will have a hand in your product being administered to the patient in time. 
And then invest in validated tracking. This is critically important. Um, you know, so many times there's this question, where's the courier? And if you don't know, that's, you know, really you can get into problems. Um, and then don't neglect the ends of the process. That's really, really important. And then the other thing I would say is please think about when things go wrong. Because if you've planned for things to go wrong, when they do, and they will, at least you've got a process in place. And you know who the small group is that you're going to get together and figure out how to sort it out. And if you haven't planned for that beforehand, you're going to end up in some very challenging discussions and invariably at 9 o'clock on a Friday night. So thanks very much. Good morning. I'm Amy Duras from Vanetti. <laughs> it's all right. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Duras. I'm the CEO and a co founder of Vanetti. And uh, Sven, thank you for playing some of the scenes from the movie that you've seen over many years up front um, from the therapeutic perspective. And before we all commit harikari, because it is just that hard. <laughs> Um, as Jeff Walsh from uh, Bluebird Bio said uh, recently, this expletive is hard. Um, we're here to help. So our company, uh, Vanetti, was uniquely found founded to provide a level of chain of identity and, and chain of custody and fidelity to this process that really does present the most complex supply chain and logistics workflow and requirements in the history of biologics. So, uh, we're here to help all of the therapeutics manufacturers and our partners in the ecosystem really perform in a way in a way they've never really been asked to perform because there's a level of interdependency, as you heard from Sven, uh, again, in a play-by-play -play that is truly unparalleled. Um, and so we're in a new we're in a new territory. What our company does um, really is provide a digital workflow and automation and a level of transparency through a software as a service layer that tracks and traces uh, from end to end. So from the moment of collection all the way through all the logistics, coordination, manufacturing, and then back to the patient for dosing. Um, we are the only independent platform to su support a successful uh, commercialized therapy in this field, a CAR T, yes, CARTA, um, one of our early customers and collaborators was Kite Pharma, uh, and we are deployed in over 65 different medical centers today. We're also qualified in the EU as well as um, have uh, customers now in, in Asia. Um, so just a couple of, uh, you heard some of this, some of this will be echoing what Sven has shared with us. Um, but I think one thing to say up front is, again, really not trying to simplify or um, minimize the complexity here. We are going to make mistakes um, as an industry, as an ecosystem. And what's really important is how we react and how we continue to collaborate. So I think we're at this point where there's such excitement and the efficacy data is so flabbergasting. Um, you know, I, I, I hope we don't lose sight as an industry and as an ecosystem on the opportunity here to share best practices and share learnings because we're all in this together. And uh, you know, unfortunately, because of the complexity, the risk for error is exponentially greater. And so this, this collaboration is absolutely crucial. It's crucial on a per batch basis on making sure there's safety and custody from end to end. And it's really true uh, for the industry and ecosystem overall. Um, plan your e-systems early. We can't say this enough. Again, in this uncharted territory of cell and gene therapy, uh, this is the first biologics instance where you actually have to include an IT system, a traceability system like Benetti, in a, in a regulatory filing because the process is the product for the first time, again, in the history of biologics. Uh, so that means that get to, you have to get to know these systems early. You have to plan uh, well in advance of what you think you might need in terms of not just the traceability functionality, but um, how you're going to interact in clinic, 
limb systems, how are you going to do your customer CRM management over time as you can move towards commercialization, ERP system planning or ERP light system planning. Uh, we work a lot with our customers on really looking at that overall systems management, not just the crucial traceability uh, component. Um, we're also just a, a point of that in terms of particularly software. Thank, thankfully, uh, software is keeping pace with some of the biologic innovation here, uh, and the ability to be flexible and configurable uh, is an absolute must in this environment because of the flexibility per batch and because of the interdependency in the ecosystem, uh, and frankly, because of the, the, uh, he the heterogeneousness of the actual workflows themselves. Um, so flexibility is key. Choose systems that have flexibility and configurability as a mainstay of their architecture. And then this point is really um, sort of near and dear to my heart in particular as a patient advocate um, because the healthcare providers are overwhelmed. Even in these relatively early days, um, there are, uh, because for the first time GMP process is now extended into clinic, because you are triggering a manufacturing process in clinic. That is a big paradigm shift for these healthcare providers who want to provide the best and the most leading edge therapies for their patients, but they're asking to be responsible in a wholly different way, and they're asking to put uh, make inputs into a workflow in a completely new and different way. So there's a lot of cautiousness um, around these therapies, excitement but cautiousness, so cautious optimism. And the problem is what's happening now, even in clinical phase, is you have multiple points of entry for healthcare providers. So they are sitting in clinic with patients ready to accession, and they have multiple usernames and passwords because they have to enter into different systems to trigger GMP process. That's a real problem, and uh, mark my words, we will have an error, a major error in the field if we don't correct this problem. Um, and we're getting to a point of a tipping point here, even at this relatively early stage. So I'm calling on all of our partners here in the room at ARM. ARM has been really a leading advocate on standardization uh, in the field. Uh, but this is, a, this is a real issue. So um, again, I would say differentiation among all the therapeutic, exciting therapeutic manufacturers here uh, is really around your protocol, not so much how you intersect with the ecosystem. We are all uh, incentivized to make that as standardized as possible. Um, so just key points for scaling. This is a screenshot of one of our sort of product status dashboards that allows multiple users, again, clinical uh, providers, manufacturers, uh, logistics, specialty courier managers, to see a single screen that shows where a batch is in its life cycle through its key process steps. Um, so that single point of control, you heard Sven talk about that. We provide the software equivalent to that, so having a single point of transparency to really supervise the process. Um, you need also the human equivalent of that, I totally agree. Uh, we allow the, and enable that human equivalent to see in real time a, a, a set of workflows uh, transparent workflows through through this screenshot. Um, so the guidelines, I think we've we've got panels at this conference talking about how these guidelines are uh, becoming clearer and clearer, for, thankfully. Um, so really looking at those digital requirements, understanding, again, this gets back to planning early uh, for the overall systems uh, approach to supporting your therapies. I already said quite a bit about the HCPs, um, continuous collaboration. Again, we were uh, founded to really promote openness and transparency and best practice. So our company really stands behind that as a key component of our mission. Um, and proven systems that let you focus, right? This is a very difficult world, an exciting one, but difficult. And so let some of the vendors and providers in this ecosystem like World Courier uh, certainly our company is ready to help. Uh, let you focus on the core competencies of your, of your organization and really invest in the R&D uh, and the protocols that are really gonna save patients' lives. I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, good morning everyone and uh, thanks a lot for coming at such an early hour uh, to attend this, this workshop here. 
Uh, I am uh, Thomas Fallner and uh, I represent Lonza, a contract uh, manufacturer. And so what I will do is I'm not going to repeat what you have already heard from Sven and uh, from Amy and from, from Simon, but what I would like to do is give you the, the perspective of, of a contract manufacturer or a manufacturer's perspective on you know, what is supply chain, what are the challenges that not everyone might think about uh, uh, when it comes to not only autologous uh, cell therapy, but also viral vector, ex vivo uh, gene therapies, in vivo gene therapies, and also allogeneic uh, uh, cell therapies. And uh, over the next few uh, minutes and, and a few slides I have prepared for you, I will touch on a few aspects where I think that they're really critical uh, to consider when, when you are in the midst of uh, developing uh, your therapies. Okay. Oh, okay. It was the right. It was the right button. Good. So very briefly, as I said, Lonza is a contract manufacturer, right? So we are not developing our own therapies. We really try to enable the industry, and and Lonza has been in this business for for many many years. You know, we are a large uh, contract manufacturer for biologics, for for chemicals, and uh, also for for more than ten years in the cell and gene therapy uh, field. So I want to bring it down two to three simple concepts here. And I put this under the umbrella of, okay, commercially viable cell and gene therapies, because this is in the end uh, how we will get uh, uh, these, these therapies to patients in a, in a sustainable way, right? The first is they need to be uh, cons uh, consistent and they need to be safe, right? So if you look right now at uh, most of these processes, they are very open, they are, they are manual. Right? Uh, you might say, okay, well, it, it, it is what it is. But if you think about it, that adds uh, a complexity and, and risks. Because if they're open on manual, it means there's a lot of labor involved, right? And again, labor uh, is, is part of a, a supply chain uh, for a manufacturer, right? So then uncontrolled crit critical process parameters, right? So how do you measure? that you have uh, the, the right product, that you have a safe uh, product if you haven't uh, identified uh, the, the parameters. One big thing from a supply chain perspective uh, is, of course, raw materials, right? And again, I give you here the perspective, if you look now inside manufacturing, right? I'm not talking about how the patient gets to the, to the site or how the patient gets from the site uh, back to the, to the hospital. But here, when you look at what's going on within manufacturing from a raw material perspective, there are a lot of raw materials, right? And what is the big challenge here? A lot of those are single sourced, right? There is only one producer who actually makes that. Now you can imagine coming back to what uh, uh, Sven and Amy said, okay, now you have a patient identified, but all of a sudden you say, well, uh, I should have more, uh, probably managed my raw material inventory better. Yeah, that's, that's uh, uh, easy said, right? But what if it's just not available? If the vendor tells you, yes, we can you give you this small quantity, uh, we ship you another batch next week and the batch never shows up, but the patients are already pre-screened, they're scheduled, right there in, in anticipation of that. It's, it's, it's a significant uh, challenge, right? Uh, also, it's, it's just not raw materials, it's also consumables, and you might have read uh, this uh, in, the, in, the, in the trade journals, right? All of a sudden, there's a shortage of even vessels uh, to, to grow cells, right? Uh, how do you how do you you know manage this? You know, in a clinical setting, you might say, "Well, uh, I don't have time for this," uh, but yes, you will have uh, quite a challenge if all of a sudden your clinical trial cannot be completed because you don't have uh, these consumables. And another thing is, of course, uh, quantities, right? Uh, a huge supply chain challenge because you, you want to get this into the markets, into the different markets, into the different uh, countries within uh, uh, regions, right? Uh, it's, it's uh, to, to give you a few examples, there's a lot of fresh material, right? When a patient sample comes in, there's a lot of fresh, it's not frozen, uh, where you can say, uh, well, uh, I, I leave this in the freezer for a while and I organize everything around it. No, that comes in, it has, a, for the most uh, part, relatively short lifespan and you need, uh, everything needs to be, to be ready. Everything needs to be uh, coordinated, right? Uh, 
then it's also about scaling up, uh, a scaling out technology. When you look at, at uh, allergenic and, and autologous, I mean, for autologous, uh, the scaling out, of course, uh, it has its own challenge. And, and I give you one su supply chain uh, uh, risk here is, you know, increasing demand last minute of saying, oh, we need to treat more patients. Uh, uh, can we have additional slots? Can we have additional capacity? Uh, yeah, you might say, oh, well, that shouldn't be a problem, right? I mean, everyone is, is happy, especially CDMOs, to take on more business. Yeah, easier said than done because uh, there's a lot that goes around it and, and needs to be uh, very well coordinated. Uh, then, uh, touching on, on a little bit on, on, on cost, uh, uh, how is this all going to, your supply chain going to impact overall cost of, of manufacturing? Uh, I mean, yes, that, that raw materials uh, are expensive and testing is expensive. Uh, we will have to, to deal with it and there will be solutions to, to hopefully bring this down. But another thing that drives cost up and again has a huge impact on, on from a supply chain perspective is these, these processes are labor intensive, as I said, right? And it's not just limited uh, to, to, to the actual uh, manufacturing. You got to think about now from a supply chain perspective for a manufacturer, you got to hire these people, you got to train these people, right? It's, it's ordering, you know, you need to, to have this all uh, coordinated. And then the last thing is, is the capacity and, uh, and, and resource uh, utilization availability. I mean, as you can imagine, you, you cannot last minute expect that, that everything is ready because, okay, we, that the patient couldn't be scheduled on that day. It has to be uh, now moved further, uh, to, uh, moved out a day or two. Uh, yes, that's easier said than done. And of course, everyone tries to, to, to make sure that you can accommodate uh, these challenges. But it's, it's uh, when you then think about how many therapies are being manufactured, let's say within uh, CDMOs, or even if you have your internal manufacturing, you need to coordinate this, you know? You gotta think about your people. People have the biggest challenge when it comes to a supply, from a supply chain perspective, because there's limited hours that they have, you know? You cannot double, triple stuff. So lots of considerations uh, when it comes to it. The good thing is, it's all solvable, right? It's, it's all solvable. And you know, there, there we have a, a few uh, uh, providers in the room who are thinking very hard that this don't become risks that are unmanageable. Okay, what, it, what in the end will help, right? Again, this is very high level and, and I'm not gonna take too long because we wanna get to a discussion and, and answer your questions, right? It's, it's, we, we need to improve the qualities, increase the quantities and reduce the cost, right? It, it's, it's very broad statements, but what would de definitely help? It's automation, it's not just manufacturing automation, it's exactly what Amy said as well, you know, automation systems, IT, it's an IT problem now. Uh, then you need to also look at uh, the, the capacities. You gotta be able to be flexible. You gotta have from a supply chain perspective uh, a global uh, 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 sites to manufacture, right? You gotta also coordinate that these are fully uh, utilized, that your people always stay trained, you have your people available. Right. Not come on. Okay, this is uh, just my, my last slide, uh, which, which shows you uh, what, what Lonza has done for, uh, in regards to one aspect, and that's, that's making uh, manufacturing sites available globally so that right now we, we don't have, you know, in all instances frozen uh, in, we don't have frozen out product in all instances, so you need regional manufacturing, right? Because you cannot ship, as Simon said, certain things across the world if, if they have a shelf life of a, a couple hours or, or even if they have just a day, you don't get them across in, in, in that short period of time. So uh, I hope uh, I, I, I stimulated some thoughts and uh, we will hopefully then have a, a very productive discussion. Thanks a lot. So I'm hoping with all of that, um, that you've all had a chance to have as much coffee as it needs to think of questions um, and have, have sparked some interest. I think the biggest thing that came out is to plan early and the biggest problem is people. Um, and one of the biggest problems in there is the patient because they might not turn up. They're, the raw material given at the beginning is the biggest variability in any trial. So has, has anybody got any questions they want to fire at the panel? to get us going or, or shall I kick off? 
Great, we've got somebody brave at the back. Is there a mic? Come. Yeah, great question. So the question, in case everyone couldn't hear in the room, was blockchain. Where does blockchain, does blockchain apply in this use case? Uh, and if so, when? So we, um, we're we a software company. So we we have been investigating blockchain and AI from the beginning and really contemplating how uh, how those technologies will, will work into our infrastructure. Uh, Blockchain really applies at significant volume. So the benefits of blockchain really don't accrue until you've really got a statistical significance on your platform. We're years, maybe five, 10 years away, uh, given the projections in this field, uh, from really seeing a value. And I think the other component of this gets back to the point about collaboration. In order to set blockchain up to be successful in this ecosystem, we have to standardize it. And in order to standardize, we have to have recurring process. And recurring process does not always exist in this market today. So there are some fundamental building blocks we have to put in place before we can really realize the potential of blockchain. And, and actually, it's a similar comment for AI. So. Anybody else want to play to that one? Because I'm out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> any, any other takers for the beginning? So I think it, it would be useful, so we haven't had a chance to hear from, from Jim yet and, and UC Davis and sort of that academic perspective. We, we've had a lot of commercial thought, but a lot of these therapies, certainly the early ones, have been driven by the academics. Is, is there some lessons learned? Yeah, no, I, I, I can give a comment. It's great to see Sven's, I thought all the presentations were very, very great, but Sven had his... <clears throat> a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and that took me actually back to when I played in the NFL. I had a coach, Bill Walsh, who loved that saying, you know, and then, then I was looking at the slide itself that had the process, and it actually reminded me of his, some of his plays, these complicated West Coast offense plays, if, if you're American and maybe you remember the 49ers invented that. But then the last... Uh, analogy is is like when you actually are out on the field, how different the uh, play actually is to what it looks like when it's on the blackboard. And and uh, the same thing I think is true at UC Davis. Um, we have a GMP with that I, I'm involved in in terms of uh, about 70 percent of the work we do is uh, with companies and 30 percent our own faculty. Uh, and we have a um, an alpha clinic as well. So we have in nine months, we put together eight trials, 12 near uh, finishing the protocol and agreements, and then four INDs, all through support from CIRM. So really, you know, appreciate their helping us to launch that. And, um, and so it's really, I get a chance to sit and actually experience some of what was talked about uh, when referring to the hospital or the patient or the transport or the handoffs uh, that all occur. Much of what we do, uh, between, even between the GMP and, and, the, uh, and the Alpha Clinic, is handoffs of paper or Excel spreadsheets. And, and uh, as, as good as we are, um, you know, that's certainly not scalable or really the kind of platform you'd want to even have in a best case uh, perspective. So the development of technologies to help that, I think, are, are great. It makes me feel as though, you know, that's why I kind of titled my comments uh, <clears throat> that uh, it's inevitable that uh, a lot of this is going to play out on the playing field, so to speak, of the academic medical center. So it's an exciting time, I think, uh, but uh, a little bit of a daunting one as well. Uh, and so th that's kind of my perspective. I thought all of the presentations were perfectly on point and really uh, appreciated them. So it's interesting what you say about the handoffs. Um, and certainly from our perception, everybody sort of operates in their silo. So you've got the manufacturing team who do their thing brilliantly and the courier do their and the clinics do their. So when it's handed off between, it, it, is that what you're seeing from your side? I don't know, Sven, from all the products that have been launched? 
Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I have to echo the, the, the wide use of paper and Excel spreadsheets and people on telephones. And so it's, you know, it's absolutely wonderful to see development of electronic systems and, you know, utilizing the thing called the cloud and everyone being able to be connected and be able to see what's happening, I think is, is absolutely critical because so often this handoff uh, is supposed to happen uh, at a certain time, at a certain place, in a certain way. And very often it doesn't because, once again, we're dealing with human beings and human beings don't program particularly well, apparently. So having a way to track these mechanisms efficiently and in real time and accurately, both from an activity but also from a location perspective, is really, really important and that helps to to sort some of these issues out. Um, and I think this also then speaks to the training um, so that you know the courier knows where to go to pick up the sample. They know what to ask for. Very often it's a case of the courier even checking that the, you know, the, the, the biopsy, your starting material, has been placed in the correct container, it's correctly charged, it's put in and the paperwork is in there and you know, we've even had experiences where we would actually ask the courier to take out the paperwork and make sure all the forms had been signed. Because you'd be amazed at how many times you know, the clinician is, is writing the stuff, he's, he or she is doing the paperwork, the nursing staff fill out all the bits, you know, be it you know, taken from this part of the body, this was the size, blah, blah, and the clinician doesn't sign that last piece of paper. And if that biopsy then gets all the way to the lab, and you know your quality group takes it out and looks and says, "Oh, no signature here. We can't do anything." And that's that's great from a process perspective. That's absolutely the right thing to do. But what we often forget, because we're so busy in our silos, is that's actually a patient, and that's a therapy that that patient may be waiting for to save their lives, to change their lives, to extend their lives, to whatever. And all for want of a, a cross on a piece of paper or a squiggle. And so being able to track and being able to, to control and have a really good overview of that handoff becomes absolutely critical. I don't know if that helps answer your question. Yeah. No, I, I, I think I'd add to that as well. So we've been asked to deliver to the Mayo Clinic. That was the instruction. Driver gets to the Mayo, which door? Which clinician? Which nurse? So, so you know, filling in those forms, it, it's, it's all critical because otherwise you've got delay while somebody walks around and around the mayo, which takes a while. So, so that, that sort of traceability. Um, and the same thing with the forms to get through customs. If you haven't ticked that box, the customs agent doesn't care what's in the box. It just sits there. So that planning, that planning ahead. And so um, Thomas, are you seeing this, the same thing from the manufacturing side? Sorry, was there a question? Oh, sorry, Tammy. Do you want to start at this end, Jim? Because I know. I think that's a great question. Uh, you know, are there standards, and what should we drive towards that? It was actually a question. I, if there were no questions, I was going to ask that question myself. Because with the mail, for example, yeah, we're definitely seeing eye to eye. Um, I don't know if there, if our, does UC Davis the way we receive and handle and transport, you know, interact with patients, uh, is that the same as the Mayo, as as or, or other? or other academic medical centers and query whether that's possible or whether it would seem like that we'd want something like that. Um, so really, I don't know the answer to the question as to how my medical, this is a good question though, I, I'd better figure that out. But I would like to hear of others who, you know, are interacting with more academic medical centers, uh, you know, than, than my experience. It's a great question. So I think um, one of the easier problems to solve and standardize should be labeling. So having a single standard, ideally a global standard, for uh, what the inputs to a label need to be. So that 
takes away some of the, what is happening today is across even intercontinental boundaries, there's a, a, a stage of interpretation uh, because the labels don't really look or don't have the same data and some of those are regulatory constraints. Um, so that seems like if we could solve that problem as an industry and an ecosystem, that would be that would hopefully provide us with some momentum for for tackling some of the more difficult problems uh, around process standardization in clinic manufacturing. Thomas, <laughs> I guess I don't need to. Yeah, standards. I mean, again, I'm not too much focusing on on, on the outside of, of of the patients coming in and, and going out. I mean, uh, standards. You also can look at standards from a regulatory perspective, right? Compliance perspective, and and, and one thing that that is also uh, still uh, being developed, heavily discussed, is how can you do like mu multiple patient, multiple product manufacturing in in, in same environments, right? Because that that will solve also some of of, of the challenges. Uh, especially around, you know, how can you uh, increase throughputs, how can you get more patients treated, uh, and things like this with, with, with constant build-out and expansions. So um, I'll give it the disclosure, uh, first of all, and I was just smiling at Richard sitting in the, in the audience there. Uh, so I, I also am fortunate enough to sit on the executive committee for the standards coordinating body, and so for any of you who are involved in developing and, and providing these advanced therapies to patients, I would strongly advise you to get involved with the standards coordinating body because standards are so critical to what we do. You know, we've, we've started out in this nascent area and we have so many different approaches to doing so many different things and everyone's going their own direction. Um, and for this area to really grow up, we need to figure out what things we need to do in a standardized way. And that standardization will allow us to collaborate much more efficiently. So when you ask about what standards, gosh, we could sit here for the whole day. Um, <clears throat> I think everything from the release standards, so um, sterility testing, what the release criteria are, um, to things like packaging. Different couriers have different packaging mechanisms, different sizes. Um, if we could standardize that type of thing, we get that sort of buying power with the airlines, with the other groups to transport, and we get a much better idea of how we take things in. Uh, standardizing even you know, the couriers, making sure that the, the systems speak to each other, that Vanetti speaks to Traxel, speaks to um, Thermo, speaks to uh, um, a World Courier, speaks to, that, that everyone speaks to everyone else, and we standardize that language as to how they speak to each other. Um, I think that's going to be really important. Uh, ideally, to be able to standardize, <clears throat> as we've already heard, how these technologies come into the hospital. You know, and it may not be one size fits all, but it may be you, know, you have process one goes to the operating room, process two goes to the bone marrow transplant unit, or something similar to that. But we process and we standardize within the hospital how these things are received so that it doesn't matter if you're getting CAR-Ts, if you're getting MSCs, what, if you're getting tissue engineered product, it comes in in the same way. So it's, I think we really need to be breaking this down and, and, and working through this. And to that end, the standards coordinating body is working very closely with all of the collaborators within ARM and everyone developing therapies and advising them and providing them to patients to actually identify what are the most critical standards that are causing people the most amount of pain at the moment and really trying to highlight which those are and who we go to to try and set those standards because if I can just have a second to talk about standards That's coordinating body. <laughs> um, we're, we're there really to, to coordinate the development of standards. We're not there to develop standards. That's, you know, there are many other groups that do that extremely well. Um, and so, but we're there to help to identify the right people to develop them, the right standards that need to be developed, and then when they're developed, to roll those out and help them roll out and teach people within the industry what those standards are, why they're in place, and how to use them appropriately. So I would, I would really encourage all of you to, to get involved and contribute your expertise because, you know, with people like me on the executive committee, we need all the help we can get. You know, it seemed like that, that would very much help uh, on the educational side, right, which is really 
uh, that, that would really be powerful. Uh, in other industries, have uh, you know, I was a young attorney. I'd worked in um, semiconductor and other industries that have really embraced standards. It's uh, it's something that the medical environment is has always been less you know embrace of, of, of standards, but in this particular instance, I think it could be really key. I think it, it's, it's really important, and so many, you know, clinicians and many of you that, you know, that have been in, in this area for a long time, you will encounter healthcare professionals that do a lot of these advanced therapies, but they do them as medical procedures, and they've got, you know, their little manufacturing facility, you know, out the back, um, and they're growing and they're doing everything. And when you go to them and say, you know, we're developing this therapy, they say, well, I've been doing it over here. You know, I do it just as well. Uh, but unfortunately, that's where the standards very often fall down because when something goes wrong, the processes, the standards, the mechanisms aren't in place to be able to see why. And whilst that's good and they are providing a really important service to their patients, it's not something that's scalable. It's not something that's comparable. Uh, and so very often you find someone's getting negative results, but they're not publishing them. It's not getting out there, and people don't find out about it. And so it's really important that we take this. If we want this area to grow, we need to create a, a degree of industrialization and standardization in order to, to be able to grow and to really help patients. And it's not just about helping patients in the clinic down the road. It's about helping patients globally, patients in sub-Saharan Africa, in Southeast Asia, in the countries where none of us even think about. Uh, and that's really what we need to do. And without those standards and without those mechanisms to get the, these therapies to patients, you know, we're really just messing around in our own backyard and we're not doing the world any good. Yeah, I would like to add one thing, I mean, listening to him, and it's a standardization, actually, one of the most important things. Uh, look, at, look at making these products in Excel, right? I mean, we, we have come across, I don't know how many different products, uh, a lot. Everyone has a different process. Everyone does it different. Uh, it provides a, a significant challenge, right? Because how you gonna drive this towards standards if if there is also very little willingness to 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 move it towards a more standardized process, if you look at molecular antibody manufacturing, it's the same thing over and over again, right? Here, it's very different, very different. Yeah, yeah. I get the I'm a physician as well, so I I, I definitely get the nuance that uh, physicians kind of by nature want to incorporate into. Therapies that probably works against you know the uh, collective field. Uh, yeah, UC Davis. We have the GMP. We have the Alpha Clinic, and then uh, we just launched a two million uh, square foot research and industry park. About five hundred thousand is going to be dedicated to the cell and gene therapy. The thought I had was coming into this is to develop it as kind of a smart city to kind of combine the the what's going on in smart cities to basically allow the right partners to come in and, and kind of create an ecosystem that could be, you know, exported, including, we haven't talked about it uh, yet, but longitudinally, I think uh, logistics is going to be getting people back when they're out in the health system back into, you know, care or monitoring their care so that you can couple it with reimbursement that looks like it's going to be longer term. Uh, so I think as a major theme of that could be this this concept of uh, trying to move where we're at to the next phase, which, which involves more of a standardization in certain processes. So I uh, appreciate that. And if anyone has other ideas, feel free to contact me offline about, about how we can actually you know, go from where we're at to the next level. And when you're talking about standards, do you mean big tomes of documents around this is how you do it? or? operational systems. So I'm thinking around the advanced therapy treatment centers in the UK, which is just trying to smooth that flow. So do we need lots of paperwork, or do we need operational systems, or a mix? I think we need to be smart about it. I don't think you know, anyone here in this room at 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning is you know, relishing the idea of big tomes of paperwork. Um, you know, and I, for me, personally, I, that, you know, nothing scares me more. Um, I think it's about being pragmatic. 
I think, you know, it's, it's about thinking what is it that we need that the regulators, the payers, the reimbursement organizations will require. But then let's think about how do we do it as efficiently as possible. We're in this brand new therapy uh, way of treating patients. And we are right at the beginning of how we develop these therapies, how we approach patients, how we treat them. And we love to use the C word, you know, that, that we can cure them. And I'd love to say we can, but we don't really know yet. But, uh, you know, I think we're, we're at, at the cusp here. Why don't we think about things differently? Let's think about them in a pragmatic way. Yes, there will need to be a degree of paperwork to show how we do it. But after that, let's figure out what is it that the patient needs? What is it that the clinic needs? What is it that the manufacturer needs? Um, and figure out how we optimize the way we do things. Uh, so I think whilst there will be paper, more of it is, is operational, is how we put things in place, how we design things, how we design processes, and how we design thingamajigs, be they transport boxes, be they administration devices, be they tracking tools, be they whatever. So it's, it's just about taking a step back and thinking, how can we do this better for the patient? Has anybody got anything they want to add? So, yeah, sorry. One major issue just to build on that is obviously the standardization. There's a box coming. You got the other side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, the, the standardization at, at clinical sites is a, is a huge issue, and I hear us talking about that at every conference, but yet I don't see tracks at conferences where we're actually inviting the apheresis community, the bone marrow community, anybody of that sort to really kind of iron out what those procedures are. We all know that we don't want to micromanage them too much because then we're not going to be able to put systems in, but we have to manage certain things within our clinical protocols. So it's, I think, a, a matter of kind of bringing that community um, to more of our meetings so that we can kind of have a better understanding and tr try to harmonize on some key steps so that we can you know, have some type of control over these variable processes that are happening at all our various clinical sites. And we also have variable raw material, which is the only industry yeah. that, that, that has such a thing. That along with labeling too um, is another uh, standards issue. I don't see any like intellectual property issues around us sharing our labels with each other. We don't have to hold on to that, why don't we uh, be a little more forthcoming. I don't think it, cell therapy company A versus B, if, I, if we were to share our apheresis labels, what's the big deal? And then we could all kind of come up with what the, the best um, route for that is, which is probably, you know, ISBT compliant labels. Um, we don't ever see ICPA at any of these conferences. So this is the type of stuff that yeah. I think that maybe that, you know, we talk about problems, but maybe here are some suggestions for solutions. So, so the analogy really is the mobile phone industry only kick-started when they standardized on the GSM network and then everybody was using the common languages is, is sort of what you're alluding to. Really, I mean, Amy, do you want to play back? Yeah, yeah there. If you, if you could just drop kick it across. So um, I want to... Thanks, Sven, for talking about the standard coordinating body. I'm also on the executive committee of that. Um, but related to the ICPA question and the bringing that community in, SCB and ARM co-sponsored a small meeting in Philly within the last month where um, Be the Match and some other collection facilities were there, and we had a good discussion between um, the some of the CAR-T products and the Freesis folks. And so I think initial steps related to what you just said have already been taken within the last month. So I think you're spot on. Um, and that kind of thing is going on. And it's a situation where SCB is bringing people together. And one of the, the one thing that I don't think came out is one of the things SCB wants to do once standards are identified and feasible and working on particular areas and putting them in different SDOs is to provide some support to subject matter experts. Because frankly, working on standards in a great detail can be kind of onerous. Um, there are lots of uh, 
ballots and whatever, and we've got some staff, we're hiring some more staff to take that burden away from people. So they just provide their scientific and logistical input with as minimal burden of participation as possible. Um, related to the question about, I was at FDA for <clears throat> 17 years. Sorry about that, guys. Um, but I worked on trying to get policy forward and saw thousands of INDs. Mayo doesn't do it the same as UC Davis or UCSD. Mayo doesn't even always, at least in the past, hasn't done it different at Mayo Rochester and Mayo Scottsdale. Um, and there's a lot of standardization in some ways within institutions, but it's because of how you were trained somewhere. Mm -hmm. The same way clinical practice gets standardized. Um, and they standardize, I'm a physician too. We standardize sometimes not around the right things, but what we were trained to do. And there's a little tribalism there as well, uh, which isn't helpful. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing stand, I mean, standardization is, is obviously key. I must admit, this panel's gone off on a tangent. I really didn't expect it to go. Um, so. <laughs> but, but, but standardization answers a question when we've contained it in a box. And I, I totally agree with the point of let's standardize what we can standardize. Maybe that box. Um, but what happens when it goes wrong? Not necessarily standardization, but you know, these systems we're dealing with a variable raw material. We're then trying to stick it in, in a plane that may be hit by storms. So have people got thoughts on what their plan Bs are, how, how far in advance they think of, of that, or do they just sort of cross their fingers and hope it'll be all right? I, I really love the answer. My day job is working at, at BioFab USA, which is supposed to be working on manufacturing engineered organs and tissues. So cell therapies look easy compared to that, <laughs> and so these kind of questions are one of the things that keeps me up at night in my day job. So. Okay, because another sports analogy I, I use all the time, Mike Tyson, for anybody who remembers him, had a great quote that I've, everybody's got a plan until I hit him, um, which sort of sums up, I've written this plan and then life happens, you know, and, and so we've got this plan, we've got this lane mapped, we're going to fly it to LA and then a storm hits or, or whatever it is. It, it, is that something that, oh, yes? Sorry, no? I had another question. So. Okay, so I was just going to ask the, the panel, how do they, are you seeing people planning ahead or are we still trying to do this on a bit of a wing and a prayer? And, and where's that going to stop us? When, when's that going to become a bottleneck? Any? I mean, de definitely uh, people are planning for, for the what ifs, for sure, and adjusting when those what ifs inevitably happen. So I don't think anyone's naive to, um, the inevitable difficulties in logistics that are complicated. I just think that uh, we don't know what we don't know until we experience it to some degree, but I see a lot of active planning and careful thinking about the what ifs. Yeah, okay. I think, it, it, absolutely, I think, you know, more and more as we are, you know, when, when I started back a, a few years ago um, and we were, you know, we were shipping out literally with, you know, a man in a white van uh, going off to wherever and, uh, you know, with, with Epicel actually physically hand carrying a box of new skin, um, uh, you know, across the U.S. or even, you know, out to, to such far-flung far countries as Russia and South Africa. Um, there was no room for the what if. You know, if that plane went down or if there was a delay, that was it, game over. You know, you missed the time and then it became the case of, you know, you had a 20 hour, 24 hour shelf life. If you're at 25, 28, 29 hours, then the clinician has to make the call. Do you implant that skin or do you go back and start again? Um, and so I think since those days, things have matured quite a bit and people are now exactly as Amy says, they're starting to think about the what ifs. But very often, from a practical perspective, it's not always easy to come with, a, with an easy what if. You know, it's, it's relatively easy to keep an aliquot of cells or tissue or whatever aside. And, you know, if things happen, if the plane goes down, if the plane doesn't take off, you've got these extra cells and you can always culture them up. And that's fine. But what happens when your shelf life was so short that 
even before the cells have left or shortly after the cells have left your processing facility, you know, you've prepared that patient and you've myeloablated them. And they're sitting in an isolation ward, they've got no T cells left, and there are no cells, no new healthy repaired cells coming for them. Uh, and that's a, that's a really tough decision for a clinician to have with a patient, and it's also a very tough decision, or tough discussion for a company representative to have with a clinician, because you know, you're potentially handing that patient a life sentence. And so we need to be able to figure out not only that planning, but the planning that's actually effective so that we don't potentially put patients at risk like that. Uh, yeah, but we, we also need to look at it a little differently. I mean, not every storm lasts a month, right? I mean, usually storms are, are short. And uh, I appreciate that right now there is, there is uh, enormous uh, um, excitement in the industry. Where I'm getting with all of this is we also need to take some time to actually develop the processes of making it. And there needs to be the, some time spent on are there ways of cryopreserving the material that comes in? Are there ways of cryopreserving material that goes out? I, I fully appreciate it's, it's not going to work right now, right away, for every cell type, for every therapy. That, that's appreciated. But when someone develops a therapy, this needs to be heavily thought about it. Because, as you said, that, that becomes real issues. And, and I cannot even imagine for anyone having this discussion where you say, I'm sorry. In Washington, D.C., there was bad weather. You cannot get your therapy, right? There might have been an easy solution by just developing the process from the right, the right way from the beginning. I, I would throw in from my side. So everybody's familiar with the quality by design principle and your target product profile and all of that kind of stuff. What about logistics by design? You know, so think about how you're going to ship it. If you're going to cryopreserve, you can go from a single site, serve the world, if that's where you want to do. If it's fresh, it's what Thomas is saying, you can't. So what's the impact on your manufacturing strategy? So, sorry, you had a question at the back. I had a question. What do you think, how, how we can better utilize predictive analytic and artificial intelligence to improve the supply chain logistics and then connect it with it? How do you think that the chain will look five years down the road? In 10 minutes, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Olga. Um, so I, we did have a question earlier about blockchain. So I already, um, in a way, tangentially addressed AI. But it, they, um, so again, we can get to analytics and having real value when we have statistical significance on our platform. So that is one of our missions as a, a traceability partner to the therapeutic industry is to get to a level of smart planning and optimization across the value chain. So we see opportunities within the four walls of GMP, uh, really artificial four walls, because they're also extended clinic, right? But really focused on maximizing those, those lots and, and, and all of the tools and, and uh, inventory per lot. We see a level at that granularity, we see how does the uh, clinical network perform? So who, where are the bottlenecks? Um, what are the bugaboos within the, the courier uh, piece of the custody? So we see an opportunity for sure um, to really help every stakeholder be more intelligent about planning. It's gonna take time. And right now, I think it's really important to say this gets back to standardization. Um, and certainly as a, as a provider and a vendor in this ecosystem, we treat everybody's data as sacrosanct. We have independent instances that uh, manage our collaborators' data so that we're not sharing data across the network. So in order to get to true predictive analytics at a scale, not just per collaborator or per therapeutic manufacturer, we are going to have to share data, de-identify data. We're not there yet because we haven't achieved that, again, that level of statistical significance where these analytics will really have any import anyway. We're really going to change decisions. Um, 
but uh, for sure that has to happen at scale because these what ifs that inevitably will happen are only going to multiply at scale. And so we wanna see where data can help truly avoid those what ifs ahead of their happening. And we believe that is a, an opportunity for this field, just have to get there. Sorry, can I just come back? So we, over 50 years, we've tracked every flight. So we know the good ones, the bad ones, the good cities going in and out. So we've got that data set, but it's very much driven by the customer service team knowing that the data set's there and going through it. So it, it would be good to apply that question and see if we can automate that kind of information. Tammy? Why did this work with one patient that didn't work with another? And today, we don't know. Is it because something was dropped along the way? Did that affect the cells in some way that you know, made them less durable? I, you know, I don't know. But you know, people ask all the time, what data should we gather? What data should we, uh, should, is meaningful? Today, we don't, I don't think we have those answers, right? And, and that's where it's like, gather everything. <laughs> take those personal diaries, take those spreadsheets, you know, try to figure everything out because at some point, five years from now, if a patient fails, we need to be able to go back and forensically detail what was different between these yeah. two journeys. And I think it's worth mentioning with Maurice sat at the back there that I believe there's an AI, an ARM AI equivalent building, so maybe you want to go and chat to him later. But um, that's, that's a free one. Um, but I'm very conscious that we're coming to the end, and as a good logistics provider, I need to bring it home on the, on the nail. Um, so <laughs> just one last question to the four panelists in, in 30 seconds or, or three words. What, if you had a magic wand, what would you do based on the lessons learned to, to move the industry forwards? Jim, shall I land you with that one first? Well, why don't I go last? OK, well, <laughs> Sven, you're up then. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll be a little bit controversial because I'm, I'm never controversial, yeah. and I'd say um, we should make all therapies allergenic with a long shelf life so we don't have to uh, get into these problems. Simple. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm actually, yes, uh, also agreeing with you that that would be an easy solution, but it's not going to be that easy. Uh, what can I, what, what, what would I wish for this, what to happen? <laughs> Plan, planning, 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 planning from the get-go, expecting what could go wrong so that you are prepared at least. Um. <laughs> okay, there, <clears throat> I guess, <clears throat> excuse me, there are no dumb questions. So I think um, when some of, when, when we encounter challenge in our collaborations, it's when, we have, uh, we have, there's an assumption of, of knowledge. Um, and there's really so much more learning that all of us have to do. So I think along those lines, if we could, uh, again, as, a, as an industry, as an ecosystem, uh, really try to suss out what's intellectual property and what should be standardized process. Um, because I think we, in our rush to make you know, this gold rush happen and for patients, um, sometimes those lines are blurred. And so what's proprietary and what really is shared across the ecosystem? And because I, again, I think without having that conversation and, and asking the dumb questions to get to ferret out what's in each bucket, we're gonna, we're gonna make some mistakes and avoidable ones. And unfortunately, you know, they're gonna impact patients. I guess ideally for me, um, my goal would be to have the set of problems um, exist as uh, really looking at longitudinal data many years down the road to, to really kind of be figuring out how to pay for therapies. But because by definition, if we've gotten to that point, we've solved the formidable problems that we're talking about today. and. Um, and I do see that, you know, you know, having not been at this conference for a couple of years, it's, 
it's very exciting to be where we're at uh, with this set of seemingly intractable uh, problems. Um, for UC Davis, I mean, I guess more closely, I really, really would, you know, look forward to trying to create a, a um, campus, so to speak, to really take a crack at bringing all the parties together uh, that can figure this out, you know, and, uh, and, and get us, kind of get us down the road, get us to the next level. Um, so. And then it, just to close off from, from my side, I would say collaboration. So this is a very collaborative industry and people are really partnering together. But you've effectively got five vendors here who are technical experts in their field. Use that knowledge base. You know, these people know how to do what they do. You know how to do your little bit. We know how to do ours. Let's work together and then we can make sure that we connect these therapies to these patients. So with that, um, unless anybody's got anything else, I'll call it to a close and we can all go and drink more coffee. So thank you for your time and if you can thank the panel.